So I've been asked to talk uh, and expand on a bit what was said earlier through, through our previous speakers on the treatments of diabetic retinopathy and where we are now. And I think this is important with this group because this data is very well known to people who treat retinopathy uh, in this data. And we're going to go dive deep, a little bit deeper into it, uh, what Ian talked about, and so we can go through it. But I'm going to try to keep it at an upper level so because I know there's a lot of uh, different uh, levels here in this room, um, physicians and non-physicians. So if we kind of step backwards, you can understand where we started to look at treatment of the diabetic retinopathy. And if you look at the pathophysiology, how this starts is there is damage to the blood vessels um, and that starts the retinopathy from the hyperglycemic, the chronic hyperglycemia. And over time, that damage to blood vessels leads to ischemia. That is the dying of blood vessels. They, they start going away and we classically know pericyte loss and the blood vessels and the capillaries drop out. And so we get ischemia. And that leads to further hypoxia and damage to the retina, to the tissue around it. The response, and one of the responses is this compound called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which has become in the last two decades a very, very prominent uh, molecule for both us in trying to get rid of it in the uh, cancer literature to get rid of it in the uh, if you look at the vascular literature, they want to promote it to grow blood vessels. So veg, veg itself can do two things. It was also known as antipermeability factor, and it does increase blood vessels to leak. That leads to what we have is the diabetic macular edema. It also promotes the growth of blood vessels, and that leads to our proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So we're going to talk a bit about both of those arms in a little bit more detail and how this has been treated. So we'll look at the first thing is the diabetic macular edema. So if you look at the timelines, and we touched upon this earlier, is how do we treat diabetic macular edema? Well, previously, back in the early 80s, and let's put a little hat to the ophthalmologist and, and ophthalmology is one of the first randomized clinical controlled trials, an RCT, was actually developed by ophthalmology. It was the laser trial and it was a diabetic retinopathy study designed in the 70s and implemented in the 70s and 80s. And that was the mainstay of treatment um, for, for our diabetes. And specifically, this one is called the Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study, which was followed afterwards. So we treated diabetic macroedema with laser, and then followed by afterwards off-label use of steroids. And that has been our treatment regime till literally around 2010 when we developed and had the uh, availability of the anti-VEGFs. And this, as we heard, has revolutionized our ability to treat diabetic macroedema. <laughs> So originally we had laser, and that this is the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study. <clears throat> and this, again, this is the time when we tried to say we preserved, as Ian was saying, we preserved the vision and we prevented visual loss. That was the whole goal. But as you can see on the y-axis, it's the visual loss. We are reducing visual loss. And if, remember that word, because that was the treatment paradigm back then. And we reduce it by 50%. That's what macular laser did. And it worked well. And Ian showed this slide, and this is the pivotal trial for uh, ranibizumab, also known as Lucentis. And it is the pivotal trial that allowed this drug to be approved for the treatment of diabetic, uh, diabetic macular edema. And as Ian pointed out, there is a very rapid rise uh, here increase in the slope, but look at the access. This is amount of visual gain, not a loss, but a gain, a gain of vision. So we have a rapid rise in the first couple of injections, and these are monthly injections. Every month, the patient would come and get an injection. This was the RCT, the randomized controlled trial. Every month, they would get injection for two years. And this down here, as Ian showed, is the standard of care at the time, which is laser. You do not get a visual improvement, a significant visual improvement. You stabilized. What happened at year two, 24 months, is that laser arm 
that is that control arm was allowed to switch over into being treated with the anti-VEGF and as Ian pointed out there is a slight improvement but never to the point of where we got in the beginning of the treatment so early treatment allows rapid gain in vision late treatment you do not gain that vision so that's a very important point to take home. And this is, again, for FDA approval, you need two trials. And these are the two trials. And this is where the gain is, okay, uh, the, the lack of gain. Vivin Vista is a Flibriceps uh, trial. And this is the pivotal trial for a Flibriceps, that is ILEA from Bayer. And you can see it's almost the identical shapes rapid, rapid increase, again, of gain in vision, and there is the standard of care of laser. The Lucentis was every month, and there was two drugs, you saw the two there, it was the dosage, 0.3 milligrams and a 0.5. Here in this one, they kept the same dosage, but they said, can we give the injection every month, or can we go to every two months? So now we can extend to a two-month window instead of every month. In this pivotal trial, it showed that every four, every month injections um, was equivocal to every two month injections. So that was good. So it reduces the potential burden of the injections for the patients as well as us as the injectors, the ophthalmologists. But again, if you look at it here, about two years, they had a good, again, a crossover. <clears throat> and it showed that giving the aflibercep later did not get that visual gain. Again, reinforcing early treatment allows visual gain. Now, you can put all three drugs together. And so the third drug I'm gonna put in here is an off-label use drug called bevacizumab, Avastin, and in some jurisdictions that is used. So I put it in here because it is important to discuss. This is a trial called DRCR Net Diabetic uh, Retinopathy Group <clears throat> in the United States, and now we have it in Canada. And this is protocol T. This is a pivotal trial in terms of putting all three drugs head to head. The blue line is a flibercept, the orange line is ranibizumab, and the red line is bevacizumab, Avastin. And it clearly shows over the two years. The visual gain is m better with a flibercep and than the other two. And we talk about the area under the curve, the maximum amount of visual gain. So the worst drug is bevacizumab. But it is a gain of vision compared to laser, which is really no gain. So you will see that potentially in some countries is a utilization for treatment or even countries or some jurisdictions. Um, this is a slide I picked out because it really does discuss the importance of the visual uh, gain in the first year. And that there's a lot of gain if you have a very lo a significant loss of vision, you can gain that. But they do not gain as much as if you get them early. In other words, the, the more, the 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 better the vision and the earlier you treat them, the better they can maintain that vision. So in the first year, if your visual acuity um, to retain better than 2032, which is near perfect vision, 2040 in most jurisdictions is driving vision. If you started off with 2040, you will maintain that. If you started coming down here, which is legal blindness, 17% <clears throat> will actually get to 2032. So the importance of early, early treatment, early diagnosis to get them in will preserve the vision as Ian was talking about as well. Now you'd say, well, that's a lot of injections every month or every two months. <clears throat> but the data now goes on if we go beyond two to three, four years, the number of injections will decrease. So there is some disease modification we are doing at the diabetic macular edema level, we do not have to treat every month. We can actually start watching them and say, oh, we need intermittent boosting shots. And you can see that the number of, again, the number of injections decrease in year three, four, and five. And this is important to note because 
we can, that is very good for patients in knowing that. And then here it is, you can see the number of median injections. Okay. So really over the years, it's, <clears throat> it's not that significant. Let's flip the coin onto the other side now, and let's talk about the proliferative disease, which is really a lot of people understand is a very uh, drastic loss in vision in diabetic retinopathy, that is the new growth of new blood vessels. And again, if we look at the, the milestones in the treatment in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, PDR, the early part is we were talking about, as Ian said, in, is the lasering. We lasered and we basically amputated the peripheral retina. That was the treatment back then. And then now we have the treatment of the anti-VEGFs. And in some areas, this is now approved therapy. In other areas, it is off-label use. But this may be a trend we are all going to go towards. So as we saw in one of the uh, previous that Ian showed, the proliferative disease, again, this is the diabetic retinopathy study. This was the grandfather pretty much of all randomized clin clinically controlled trials. It showed that if you gave laser, peripheral laser, destroying the peripheral retina, you will save the, reduce the proliferative disease and save this eye from total loss of vision. And again, this is the events of visual loss. And you can see the curves get shift from the control down to the treated group by over 50%. And back then, and as still as today, our mainstay of treatment. DRCRNet, we had a new protocol come out, protocol S. Basically, it was randomized patients to laser, the panretinal photocoagulation, and then the anti-VEGFs. And what I want to bring to your attention here is very significant outcomes of p-value less than 0 0.001 that you get visual improvement with the treatment of this anti-VEGF here was ranibizumab and the surgery was less with ranibizumab than laser. And we do surgery for patients who have proliferative disease that are persistent and that can cause problems. So you had less surgery, which is good for patients. Here we talk about, this is the peripheral vision. The peripheral laser we did, you, it, it knocks out the peripheral vision and the night vision. And in fact, in the original DRS studies, 10 to 15% of patients will lose peripheral vision and loss of night vision. Your patient could have 20-20 vision, perfect vision, but they can lose the peripheral vision, and they will tell us they can't see at night. And that's because we've destroyed part of their peripheral vision. And that's also important because that's a part of vision that we need to look at. In the ranibizumab group, they did not lose that peripheral vision. Hence, a very important factor in this type of a treatment regime. And of course, because it's the same drug that treats diabetic macular edema, these patients with the proliferative disease do not get as much macular edema. So that, the trial also happened with clarity, as, as Ian said, with that. So those are two trials for that. So here we talked about the diabetic retinopathy score. Ian showed the color picture of how that progression uh, or the regression of the disease we can grade this retinopathy, and we have a very big scale that does this, and this takes some time to do, and it's not here to show you how to do that. However, give an example. If someone was here at level six, and we can grade it at that, by treating with the anti-VEGFs, the data is now coming out from multiple trials that we can go backwards at least two steps. We can go from here to there. We are turning back the disease process. It's about saying to you, same thing as saying, if you want to go from your age, take 10 years, go back 10 years in your life. Wouldn't we all like to do that? And what does that mean? It means potentially you reduce the disease process. This is something that was we're looking at, and this is a very powerful piece of work that we could look at. We are now reversing the actual physical disease manifestation. Long term, we don't know, but this is very promising. Last point I wanted to get at is 
We talked about the randomized clinically controlled trials. Those are very, very controlled aspects of how we do things. <clears throat> we all do that. We're very controlled at doing that. It takes a lot of energy and stuff. But the real world, we don't do that. Real world is we all see patients, we treat them when they can come in, we treat them because of whatever we have available. Patients come in not necessarily every month, they may go to five weeks, or they don't come in every two months, they may come in at 10 weeks. So they're off as we, as we called it, the, the, the protocols, the, the way we do it. The real world evidence shows that we do not get those visual gains like we do with the randomized trials. Protocol T, Vivid and Vista, which is the aflibercept, Rise and Ride, which is the ranibizumab, and you can see the different drugs. The real world, and the real world, and this is from Tom Trula's trials, and he looked at his work, and we have, we're now replicating, this is an example, we do not hit that. And in almost every real world evidence, we never get to the level of the randomized clinically controlled trials. And there is various reasons, and part I think we'll be going through the workshops is discuss why and how we can best get to those areas. So coming back to a take home message. There's several, and I took a little bit of liberty to expand a bit beyond the three. Anti-VEGF is superior but requires more frequent treatment monitoring compared to our previous standard of care is laser. Very importantly, the retinopathy can be regressed and we can go back to an earlier stage of the disease. Real world evidence shows we under treat. And to get the best and early outcomes, we have to have our patients educated as we talked earlier and that partly recur, re, requires an re, early referral process, and you here, in any way we can get these patients in early, as we can see from the data, early treatment, because better outcomes. And one of the things that's important is the effective use of guidelines. It's interesting, the Brahma Project showed that 44% of, of patients are not being treated to guidelines, and which is kind of funny. Physicians don't even follow it. And then that's difficult. And how can we better do that? And so these are all things, I think, questions and problems we have. And somehow we as a group will have to start being the seed to start that change. So thank you very much.